Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. This is uh, the 11-24 meeting of the United London Housing Commission. 9-11 is always the day. It makes my heart a little heavy. 13 years ago, I think of the change in our world face, but we're onward and upward and, and moving ahead. Just uh, always a little heavy moment in my heart. Um, but thank you for coming. We have lots to cover tonight. Uh, Resilience Planning and Design is here again with some terrific development of the project that we've been working on with our hot grant funding. Uh, and so we will uh, commence uh, with our agenda. Uh, from a governance standpoint, let's see, we will have a quorum if we ask Amy and Tom and Steve to act as regular voting members, if you would, please, sure. if it's necessary. I'm not sure it will be, but just so you're prepared. Thank you for coming as well, of course. Um, we do not have any minutes to review tonight. We will probably be posting some to you in advance of next meeting. We'll be catching up some, and uh, so please keep your eyes open for that. Uh, so the timing is right to turn it over to Steve Whitman and Zach Brohinski from Resilience Planning and Design, um, according to the agenda. Uh, Zach, you're first. Steve, would it be possible to get you to sit here only because the, the camera will stay sort of fixated on this group? <laughs> Thank you. Bye, yeah, Steve. See you later. I would just do this screen to share and then I can put it right up and yeah. I wonder if I just pull this in. Yeah, okay. All right. Is the mic working? Sounds like yep. it's been hearing. Yes. Yep. Um, so before we get into uh, the slides I have presented or will present, um, really not too much of this information should be should sound all that new to folks. We've been going over this stuff in really fine detail. Uh, what this presentation the goal of this presentation in these slides is really to show you uh, uh, how we're beginning to take all of that fine detail uh, and pull out from that the key items. And then how do we begin to communicate those? So this again is not set in stone. This is still a draft. This is not a, a precursor. This is not a, uh, a run through of the, uh, the forum in November. This is simply to show you some of the items that we've pulled out and are and, and will attempt to to communicate in a appealing, simple, simple uh, and effective way, come the forum. <clears throat> Is there? Am I missing something, Steve? No, I think you got the gist of it. I yep. think because we've been able to get into such detail with all of you and those of you that have been attending all the meetings, um, we want to show you that slow kind of lifting up to 20,000 feet. We may not be able to share everything that's here, but part of showing it to you is to let you know, let us know if it comes across as clear, if anything especially stands out as either confusing or really important to stress. Um, so after Zach's done, I mean, along the way, if you have questions, stop him, but after he's done, we'll pause and talk about it a little bit. And then the rest of the time, we're mostly gonna talk about the rollout of getting word out so that it's not just us there at the event. Yeah. Um, and, and just to, again, reiterate, we were, the past couple of months, we were at the needle thread scale. Here, we're, again, pulling way back uh, and looking at a much larger scale. Um, so the way that we, one of the ways that we've decided to organize all of these, all this information over the past two months is really in two parts. We're going to look first at findings across the entire town. And then we're going to start to begin understanding those development constraints, knowing that we're not done with those development constraints analysis. We're going to continue that in the second phase, uh, but we have to start understanding them. So in this first phase, this first part, again, we're going to look at findings that are pulling out across the entire town. 
So to start, we've got the total number of lots. We've got 25, almost 2,600 lots. We've got over 16,000 total acres in town of which 13% is water. So really we're talking about a little over 14,000 acres of land and a little over 3,000 acres of conserved land. So 22% of New Hampshire, excuse me, of New London is conserved. Uh, and as we've talked about, that's just below the average of the surrounding towns, uh, but it, it's pretty pretty on par with a lot of other towns that we towns and cities that we work with, that 22%. When we look at the number of single family lots uh, in, in town, about 80% of all of those are single families. So over 2,000. The number of uh, single family lots with a home, 85% of those have a home. So the darker pink are single family lots with a home. The lighter pink are classified just as single family lots that do not have a home, so they're vacant. So again, that right there are all single family lots that have a home, which means 15% of single family lots are vacant and still could accommodate a home. Going back to the single family lots with a home, the average size of those, excuse me, the median size of those single family homes is just under 3,000 square feet. Uh, across the state, the, the, the uh, average size of the home is 1,900 square feet. So that's 52% larger in New London. Is that also a median? That's an average. Yeah. It's harder, harder to find. I know. It's harder to, harder to find. All right. Yeah. So... Oh, okay. Never mind. I'll just come back. Uh, the average size it, uh, nationally is a little over 2,100 square feet. So again, 39% uh, larger than that. Uh, and maybe we can dig, Steve, we'll try to dig a little deeper to find medians, um, but it was it's a, a challenger. I think one of the reasons we did, we weren't having any luck by finding it, and one of the reasons was knowing that RKG is about to do a That's right. big data dive for you. We're going to see a hurricane, I think. Yep. And if you can, we can then update the data yep. as opposed to having two people work for it. Sticking with single family uh, homes, the median home price is over 619,000 as of uh, the most recent assessing data. So that number does account for the most recent town uh, assessing data that thankfully Adam connected me with. Comparing that to the state, the median home price in New Hampshire is 525. Median home price nationally is 361.5. So we've got 18% above the state median and 71% above the national median. Looking at multifamily homes, there's 47 multifamily homes, multifamily lots uh, in, in town. Looking at the distribution of single family to multifamilies regionally to New London, uh, it's quite a bit different in New London. It's about 2% multifamily compared to you know, just shy of 30%. We also looked at the age of single family homes versus multifamily homes. The median age of a single family home is 1978. Median age of a multifamily home is 1929. Now we started looking at uh, bedrooms. So there are 31 one bedroom single family homes in New London. The next map I'm going to show is now in addition to those single sorry, one bedroom homes still identified in red on the map uh, are two and three bedroom homes. For what it's worth, the, the median number of bedrooms of those single family homes in New London is three. <clears throat> Adding to that are four bedroom homes in that pinkish color. If we look at the numbers of these, this slide is still, we don't have an infographic quite yet. Uh, I decided to put this in today because I found it interesting. Uh, and Steve said, yeah, I think we should keep it in. Um, so we don't have a, a nice infographic for this one yet, but I think it's worth sharing with you all. 
So if we look at the percent housing stock in New London of one bedroom homes, about 2% are one bedrooms in New London. For Merrimack, the state, and nationally, that's about 11% are one family homes. So New London has much fewer one bedroom homes than the county, the state, and the national average. Looking at two to three bedroom homes, it's about right on par. So 64% uh, are two and three bedroom homes. Merrimack, New Hampshire, nationally are about the same. If we look at four plus greater homes, excuse me, bedroom homes, uh, you can see New London's 34% are four and more uh, bedrooms compared to Merrimack, the state, and nationally are much lower. So the takeaway here is New London has a much lower percentage of one bedrooms, about average for two and three bedrooms, and many more four and greater bedrooms. The second part, so those are the, the sort of real broad key findings uh, of the of the town-wide analysis. Let's maybe pause there sure. on that data. So if there are any questions, yep. it's easy for us to go back if you want to. And we know that this wasn't a reference slide, but Zach showed it to me in the office today. I was like, that's an important takeaway though, like to see such a low percentage of one bedrooms, whatever that means, such a high percentage of four or more. It's something that we felt we should share and that that message can be refined continues to be important. Um, did you have a um, map that showed the one bedroom ones? I think yes. I uh, wasn't concentrating on it. That right there uh, are the one bedroom <laughs> homes in New London. In red? In red, yeah. You were like 20. So there's 31. 31. They're probably some of them are probably just quite small. Well, I, that's what I know. Um, I mean, get her points on there is a one bedroom, bedroom right? Bedroom. So, yeah, it was but that's yeah, that's um, the only one I've ever seen. <laughs> honestly, I think probably a lot of them are seasonal um, camps and cottages, and I know a couple of those places on the the north shore of Pleasant Lake, just because I've been there. Um, but I think. If we were able to somehow pull out um, the seasonal structures, that would be interesting. And in some ways, it's not really going to tell a drastically different picture. It's a small number, whether it's 30 or it's you know 19. Um, but it's interesting. I was trying to sort of drive myself around town and all the places. I mean, I'm in real estate. Right? Right. So, I mean, the cottage is one of the few of any I've ever seen. I certainly ever haven't sold one. Yeah, we can we can we can look uh, deeper into the type of structures, and I suspect that most of them will be camps or cottages. Um, but we can look at that and confirm. I think that might be interesting yeah. because they, then they're not really viable for housing year round. So that'd be good to know, right? Mm -hmm. I think what's interesting is if we can show that it's actually not even thirty-one, that it's an even lower number, yeah. and you're already so much lower than other places. A similar phenomenon existed in Lancaster, New Hampshire last year when we worked there, and it wasn't as big a finding to us initially until we started talking to the public, and we found out there were a lot of people looking for one bedrooms. I think, Adam, you mentioned there's a redevelopment that's primarily one-bedroom apartments. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't know that was a demand. We didn't know that was a lack of supply. As a result, somebody who was planning a project in that community switched his plan, got more units, and provided more one-bedrooms and that's under construction now. So who knows how the information will be useful? Right. I think the questions you're asking are super helpful. Yeah. Um, one sort of next step piece of information that maybe is something for Eric, would be interesting to know what the square, the median square footage for a one bedroom is. Um, because if we say, you know, we have a 3000 square foot house as our median, and that's actually the equivalent of you know, six one bedrooms, um, you know, from a land use perspective, you could use, you know, take a very small area and have the same, you know, visual impact and physical impact of one home that mm -hmm. increases our one bedroom housing stock by 20%. Um, Great point. That's a good point, which is would be interesting to know how small mm -hmm. is, is, can you go with a one bedroom?
you know, size would be helpful uh, on the one bedrooms, but one bedrooms, of course, are starter homes, right? It's uh, and for a family. My first home was slab on grade one bedroom bungalow in Texas. So, and can you? I can't really see it, but can you, There's, do you know what that, the red one, the red blob down? No, here, off of 89? Down on the, yeah, what south of 89. That? What do we think that is? I don't, yeah, that's uh, Adam. I think it's, it's actually. It's enough to the lake to be Lake Ave in George's Mill. No, um, it's so, actually on the market right now. Um, it is a it is? very unique situation that somebody was going to have horses there and they built their barn and it has like a one bedroom apartment over the barn that I believe was originally intended for like the caretaker of the horses and their life changed. Is that yeah. Tr Tracy Road? Yeah, okay. I yeah. Yeah. Oh, um, sorry. You know, it's an example of, I, <laughs> I doubt that somebody that buys that property is going to utilize it in the same manner. Right. Um, yeah. You know, it, yeah okay. it will likely have a, a very nice home built there. We're losing another one, but right. I mean, right. That, the asking price, I, it's well into the seven figures for the asking. Get on that, would you? <laughs> well, yeah, any other questions or comments so far? And just sort of on that topic too, the, interestingly, the one across the street from that, I believe is the conversion of the old stone barn from the original Tracy farm. Um, that uh, uh, I can't think of her first name, Marilyn, help me out. Um, Mike's sister, um, Mike Hansen's sister, um, Jenny, Jenny Hansen, um, uh, converted the old, the historic yeah, stone. About this? Yep, yeah, um, which is actually a pretty cool adaptive reuse of the old stone barn, really. And she does, she lives there, it's her house. Any other questions or comments? Great, Zach. So the second part of this was again, understanding those development constraints. We've talked about these a number of times. Um, the way I've sort of been starting to see this thing, there are really two rounds of these development constraints. The ones we've talked about already that was 250 foot shoreline protection areas where the town's trying to, to avoid Further development, uh, the entirely conserved lots, knowing that those can no longer be developed at all, uh, and and uh, the homeowners associations. There is, <clears throat> excuse me, there will be a second round uh, of those development constraints. I think I've got a slide uh, later on about those. Uh, but so to start with here, again, we have our, our 2,600 uh, total lots in town. Uh, if we're looking at the shoreline protection areas, there's a total of 585 lots that touch that boundary. So a little over almost 3,300 acres of that. Um, and I think, Adam, you've said that there's some changes to some of those larger uh, properties up in the north. Um, and I think I have an email out to try and get the more recent parcel data. I just haven't mm -hmm. haven't seen that quite yet. It's hot off the press last week. So There you go. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, if we then look at the entirely conserved parcels, what I'm going to do here is just add on those. So if we look at this map, there are more than those 39 conserved lots, but some of the other ones are already accounted for in the shoreline protection areas. So there are 39 additional lots that are entirely conserved, accounting for just shy of, of uh, 1,300 acres. We then add on those homeowners associations for an additional 316 lots, about 550 total acres. So we look at all of those different types of constraints and if we pull them out, about 62% of New London's land can accommodate additional housing. That's the big takeaway here. Um, so all that, all that uh, nitty gritty fine detail that we went through over the past couple of months, looking at a great deal more information about each of those, um, the culminating, one of the culminating points there is, is this. Uh, we do know that there are more constraints to consider, but right now, as it stands, with 62% of the land in town still able to accommodate additional development um, or additional housing, um, that's, I think, notable. 
So again, that was the first round of those types of development constraints. There are more that we just haven't gotten to yet. That's That'll be part of that next phase. So looking at wetlands and steep slopes, uh, other natural resource priorities. Um, so we're going to dig a little deeper in trying to again better understand uh, what land is, really is still um, available for, for further development. So some of the big takeaways here, if we're looking at part one, that existing housing stock, uh, it's predominantly single family homes. They are larger than average, more expensive than average, and ultimately uh, it's not particularly diverse and it may not be meeting the community's needs. In terms of additional housing potential, we talked about some of those development constraints and ultimately uh, it, it appears so far that New London can accommodate uh, additional housing. So that's really not a great deal of new information, I don't think, but rather a different way of seeing it. Again, we were at a really fine level a couple of months ago. We're beginning to pull ourselves back uh, and look at the broad brushstrokes, the broad takeaways. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll, I'll pause again for any additional comments or questions. The 62% uh, of New London land can accommodate additional housing. You so said not incorporate further limitations of wetlands, steep slopes. That would also include frontage, correct? That's correct. Okay, should mention that. Uh, that's, yep, we can have that. That's a significant yep. um, limiting factor and not something that we can easily uh, account for. It's a good point. Under and I think we also have to clarify, Zach, that this is under it's with an under it will be less than 62% once we figure out what those other constraints are. Yeah, no question. Considering current regulations, but if regulations were to change, the number could change. If yeah. you were to allow for smaller lots of certain parts of the community, the number could change. And I think the next phase that Zach's talking about, second part of the op grant. You may decide that there are areas where you really don't want to see, you would never want to see density, and you would never want to see a push for more than single family. And so we start to subtract those areas next. So is the does the next phase include things like I'll just mention the elephant in the room? The situation that's going on right now with two with continuum and with twin pines not being able to move forward due to what we consider a constraint, right? That's environmental. So is the next phase that we're talking about including those kinds of constraints? Because the other the other question that and maybe there are other people in the audience knows about this, but um, when I think about it, Highland Bridge is below where Twin Pines is looking to build. But my understanding is that, well, it's it's maybe above in terrain, but it is below on County Road, right? And they are, and correct me if I'm wrong, they are on town water and sewer. So they're not they're not having any issues with water, but we we have issues with water, different kinds of issues, but we have issues with water. So I'm just asking, is the next phase going to include that kind of a constraint and those kinds of factors that have to be included when you look at that 62 percent? Mm -hmm. Okay, and so yeah, yeah. So we can septic. we can why well, septic septic as well, yeah. Yeah, so the I, I I correct me if I'm wrong. We're talking about the subsurface water uh, situation, so we can certainly uh, look into the subsurface water resources, aquifers, and, and and different types of aquifers. You know, there are high, moderate, low transmissive aquifers. How quickly does water move underground? Uh, and we can certainly look at that. Absolutely. I think even more than that, that maybe Zach would be at least documenting what you do know. And I mean, some of these things are barriers to the types of development you would consider. And it may have mean that you have to consider you know, lower density types of development until they're resolved, you know, other things. We wouldn't want to see you 
work on zoning changes and bring them to the public and have them not be right. It, there's no right, exactly. We don't want to be encouraging to change any of our zoning situation if there are other things that are just gonna yeah. So I um I was absorbing some things, but I'm not sure that the 62% does not include any zoning constraints that exist currently. That's correct. Just land. That's there. correct. Okay. Well, with the exception of the acreage, yes. that's a zoning constraint. That's what's oh, wait. that's based say, on, right? Say that again. So you're you're correct. And then another step that we can go into is looking at those minimum lot requirements, which this does not account for, what you're looking at there. And and even just they may have the right size, but they may not have right right the room. Yep. So it's not considering those. It's just sixty-two percent. There's sixty-two percent out there that it's possible could accommodate more. That's correct. Uh, then I'm I'm a little confused, and I assumed, which is just not the right approach, that what you meant was 62% of the land area is made up of parcels that are able to be developed that comply with current zoning, except for the things that we haven't limited them by, which includes frontage and wetlands. In other words, 62% of the land area uh, comprising lots that comply with the current zoning. So, oh, no, not not That's yet. Not I don't I don't have that imagery yet. Okay, then, yeah. then we ought to be a little bit clear. That's correct. Okay. Yeah, fair enough. Yep. That, yeah. Yep. Absolutely. Because otherwise, you'll jump to conclusions in the wrong way. That's correct. Yeah. And so, you know, part of that next part of the slides that haven't been developed quite yet might be of this. Yeah. Now we looked at development constraint. I mean, I'm sorry, minimum lot requirements, and we can pull out all those numbers that we had talked about earlier. Uh, yeah. that that don't comply based on the lot requirements. Yep. And just to clarify, I think one of the reasons, Peter, that we kind of went backwards from the last meeting was because we know we want to do that exercise. We don't want to overwhelm people in November. We want them to come in and get some information and find see that there's a process that they can participate in and they can learn alongside the commission and people that have been actively engaged. Um, and we will get to that, which means this number will get smaller. Yep. There will then, of course, be people who don't want to ever subdivide or do anything so that number gets smaller but we may want to play around as we did before with different zones and show the number of lots that could accommodate an additional unit or units um and then show what it would look like if you were to change the zoning up or down sure. um and say like wow if we were to allow these other kinds of housing here's what it could look like here's where they may end up if people want it so people get a sense for what it looks like and i think that was part of this exercise for the second phase mm -hmm. So that's the reason. Got it. Yeah. Got it. It's good. Good. I get it. So is the language there on the 11th side could possibly accommodate more? Yeah. We can add a possibly in there. Potentially. Up to potentially. Right. And again, I, you know, this is going to change. Um, and, and, you know, part of the, I think one of the things we're looking for today is to get some general comments on some of the aesthetics. So I know the number is going to change, but as we've taken some of that fine grain detail and we're trying to synthesize it, are we on the right track in terms of the look, in terms of some of those other figures that we threw out beyond that one? Um, how does it feel to folks? Just a comment on it. You turned on that. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but the 62% includes continuum and the uh, percentage land. Yep. And if we um, were to back those two parcels up, what does that 62% become? I mean, is it material? Does it go below 50% or? I'm not you know? I'm not familiar it, with the specific parcel. It's only a total of 55 ish acres. Yeah, that wouldn't budge. Yeah. So, so what it wouldn't. It, uh, that's not going to budge that. Um, absent water, the, those lots are. Undevelopable. So, but what you're saying the non-material relative to the 62%. Right. Um, okay. I think maybe uh, the 62% is a huge number. Yeah. And, and yeah. as for a general reaction, I'll give you my reaction. It's a huge number. So the next thing I do is try to grapple with what it means um, after I get over that emotional reaction. So maybe another slide that would that would go with that. Um, after right after that is. But this does not include the constraints we need to think about and study further. The first one is zoning. And so 
zoning frontage setbacks, you know, so people quickly understand that 62% is, is sort of the biggest number, uh, I think to, Mar to Marilyn's point, potential. But here's a list of things that, that would limit it further. That's right, and, and it, it, it's not much different than that map there where those are three constraints. We can add on the others and start to start to whittle away these yellow parcels. And so that's what we, yep, that's exactly right. It's well, I wasn't. Name, it's a nice takeaway, but it's. Sure. It's really not down to where it needs to be for I people to understand. Couldn't agree more. 2% is really not realistic. Yep. Just, couldn't agree more. Good first step. Yep. It's a good, yeah, I agree. Good I first think step. the presentation just, you asked about just the yeah. look of it and that sort of thing. I, yeah, I think it's. Easy to follow, at least, you know, and graphics on the side. I mean, I think it looks good. I think another way that we could things. potentially frame it is that it doesn't have to be thought about through the lens of purely single, an additional single family home, that there could be an attached ADU. Right. It could be a different version of a detached ADU that's more palatable. And there's other ways of potentially having some impact on the, the housing landscape that don't necessarily equal dividing up a birch acres lot that probably is not subdividable, but it doesn't mean there's not potential there for another unit. Yeah, like the ultimate slide would be showing all those sort of overlays that you have, but it would show really these in this color is really where it's at. Yep. So like you don't want to be confused by all the other colors. You just want to know exactly which which temporarily is that. Temporarily, it's very that's temporary. it. Right. Yep. I couldn't agree more. But yep. some of the reason for that, Amy, is to not get ahead of ourselves before we know the data, and also not leave people to get so far ahead of the public that they can't follow and digest it and talk and get feedback. Um, but you're right. And the other fact is, I mean, we're doing this with a housing lens. So we're saying, well, maybe we as much as 62% could accommodate more housing. Well, some of that 62% could be future conservation land, could be other things. Um, and we probably, in the presentation, if this were to be one of the key findings, we probably should clarify that as well. Um, that it doesn't mean it's destined to be housing, you know, but if there's, there's ample opportunity. And if there's ample opportunity and you can continue to refine it, then the Town can have real conversations about okay, then where could it be, and what does it look like? To Adam's point, you know, what combination of things would be palatable and would accomplish the mission? Right. Give me one more second. I, I'm really not quite sure exactly what I'm trying to say here. I'm trying to form it in my mind. But we, when we get this refined down and we have, this is where it's at and stuff, then people are going to start looking at it saying, oh my God, that's right next to my grandmother's house. Or that's right next, wait, wait. You know, that's I mean, how you want. I'm not, I want them to do that in a sense, but I, I'm just not quite sure. If you know what I'm saying? Good. <laughs> yeah, there may be some of these conversations we might want to take a lot lines off. Yeah, there's so that there so are. Too focused on that? Because that's yeah. what I would do. Yeah. yeah. That's a good idea. I was sort of thinking that we just learned lot lines and just had areas that were potential so that they're not saying, you know, oh my God. Or... I, I think it's a worthwhile item to consider because once people's properties are on there, I've seen it happen in, in, in the conservation world where you start publishing people's properties and saying, this is where development could be. People can get defensive um, and wait a second, you're you're gonna, what are you gonna, you're gonna take my land, you're gonna develop my land, wait a second, what's going on? So I think it's a worthwhile question and consideration. Yep. You know, and I think as, as areas or that would support it or parts of town or whatever, but I think you're right, you don't want them getting too focused on the lot lines because that's gonna just distract entirely away from the idea. As opposed to taking the discussion to well, in these areas, where would be some logical places that it, it might work? So let me ask. I think it's a great a great point. If we're going to remove lot lines, I would say they need to be removed from the beginning. 
And so, oh, yeah. for instance, if you've got that and you're adding other other overlays, people are seeing they're they're looking at their property. They know where it is. Um, you so would you just remove the lot lines at the end? Because I think people are already keyed into their property. I, let me offer an idea. Um, you all have much better eyesight than I do because um, I was always envisioning this process, including a map that would sort of evolve in color and removing different items and showing us detail. But uh, being in such smaller scale that you wouldn't be able to pick out your individual lot. And so would it achieve the same end um, and maybe be better or worse, you let me know, to have the map a little smaller so that it's um, it's almost impossible to pick out your own lot. I can't see my own lot, um, but maybe just a tad smaller would make it, would, would break away from the reality tests that people would be seeking. Would that be helpful? Mm -hmm. No. No? I, I think the, the stuff in the beginning where the layers are with the lots on it, I think that's interesting because... Yeah. I don't think people would get too focused on the lots at that point as much as they we'd be drawing their attention to, you know, this is conservation, this is waterfront, this is you know where we can't do. But at some point, I think the lot lines could become very distracting. I think you're right. I and I think to some degree, I mean, we're we're making all this transparent, right? So you're making the PowerPoints available, and that's the goal is to put this stuff out there. Right now, it's it's a pretty big area of the town that's yellow. Um, as we get smaller, people are still going to know where they are, but they may be less fixated on that. And they, their questions might be like, how could this neighborhood or how could this section of town change? And that's what we want to have those conversations, right? So that they can inform us of if would a duplex that looks like this be, you know, that offensive or would an ABU be, you know, workable in this area? And we can get that kind of feedback. Some of it will also be on some of those bigger lots, you know, would mandating conservation subdivision with a percent workforce housing um, be a possibility. It wouldn't happen unless someone came in to do a major project. But if they came in to do a major project, otherwise, would it just be cookie cutter? And would that be even mm -hmm. more offensive to folks? So it's so that we can have those conversations in phases two and three. Um, and I think, I don't know that we, I mean, the horse is out of the barn as far as showing the lots and people are pretty wise. They can figure it out using the town's GIS software, I'm sure. But going forward, I wonder if just Marilyn's point, if we could just simplify it. And maybe some of the images are smaller, but we are going to zoom into different zoning districts and want to ask, you know, informed questions. Well, we're really in the data analysis stage yeah. so that we can come up with some ideas for potential zoning or revision or understanding of our town uh, before we get into the details of specific changes in zoning. So as we're developing concepts and, and analyzing what we have, I think removing lot lines is a great idea. And then as we get to the point where we're, we're developing concepts, then we need to be transparent, of course, and put lot lines in, and, and uh, then it would be a little more granular. So I think it's a great idea. I, I, I just really think we need to, I mean, this is, this is, we're trying to find out the first phase of what we, who we are, what we've got, what we can, you know, potentially look at as possibilities in the future. And I think the less we talk about zoning changes at all, the better. I mean, this, this is information. We don't know when it was going to be zoning changes, or we don't know what it's going to be. But if we just don't want to even, I don't even want it in my vocabulary in this presentation, in a sense. And also bear in mind that, that to, to I, I agree with you because this is the first phase. This is the discovery phase. We're not at the point where we're where, where any decisions are being made. Um, so I, I would I would agree with that. I have a thought. I understand the whole process of <clears throat> bringing it down, bringing it down to a point of reference, and looking at it almost holistically in different areas. But I think. Once we get down to the nitty gritty, we're really going to have to identify them quite obviously. Mm -hmm. And that's when people are going to go back to that map and look at it and say, oh, grandma's house or whatever it is, or my house or their backyard or whatever. Um, I think that we have to be prepared to respond to that 
because our experience over the last several years has been that any change is wonderful in the master plan, but it's not wonderful when it comes to voting. So we have to bring it down, bring it together, and be fairly idealistic in terms of the presentation, providing enough information, but we also have to be aware of not providing enough detail so that we raise the questions. Mm -hmm. And that takes us back to the drawing board again. I think looking at all this and bring it down, let's look at what it looks like and then decide at that point now, do we want to make it a little more identifiable or do we want to go with what we have? Because if it's not totally clear, people will question you. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'm not sure they'll be ready for it on November 13th, but eventually. Yeah. And whether we're looking at zoning change in the future or we're looking at uh, any other potential problems that could be out there, water, all those other things. Um, we have to be kind of prepared to respond to that. So what we don't, we're really looking for, we're looking for that, like we said the other day in the last meeting, we're really looking for the bottom line. And if we can get to it, but with clarity and understanding of how we got to it, I think that's important. What was the process? We just sit it on maps or erasing and color. No, a lot of study went into this. Just a thought. So, so are we all agreeing that we're going to remove the lot line? That's what I'm hearing. Yes. Because it, we're in the think, discovery phase. And at what point yeah. would you remove them? Say that one more time. At what point would you remove them? I, I, I honestly, when we get to the this is like this is really what we're talking about as far as what's really possible. You gotta have those lot lines. I mean, if you're gonna be transparent, aren't people gonna want that? But we're we're talking about where we are in this this discovery. It's not sitting down and drawing, you know, looking at each one of those lines. And we're looking at an area, what an area could support, what is possible. We don't we don't want people to get distracted by the fact that you know we're not saying that things are going to happen there, but this is what's possible in an area. I think the lot lines are fine all along the way, showing stuff, but when you're trying to just define areas about that might support stuff, and that number's going to come down dramatically. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. I just said what one is. I just said, yeah, that makes more sense now. Okay. Okay. Sense. Feature. With one no, caveat. Yes. One cat. One cat one cat layer. I think the lot line discussion we're gonna repeat, we're gonna revisit this a couple of times. Sorry. I think to Marilyn's point there'll be a, a next phase where you may want to make it simpler and not get caught up either in what you know about the parcels. This phase, it's data collection, it's data analysis. We need that lot level information. That's what Zach took all his time to join was the assessor's information on the GIS. And if we, if there were to be any regulatory or non-regulatory initiatives in the future that you identify in phase three that are area specific, you may want to bring the lot lines back mm, yeah, because those people are going to know what road they're on. That's where I was going. Yeah, so yeah. you may be, go away, I, I would agree. the analysis and come back. Yeah, yeah I, I would you agree. You might change your minds too. And I, I think the points you're both making, Marilyn and Amy, are, are they're both valid, but I think they're at different points in the process. Right. I think at this point, at the end of this process, maybe it makes sense to remove those lot lines. Once we get into a finer scale, uh, more detail later on, bring them back, which makes perfect sense. Yeah. Yeah. We can do that. Oh, yeah. Right. Click on the line. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can I hand it back to me? I do. All right. Um, Adam, you can decide if you want to keep slides up, or I don't. We have that one that we make sure later, but I don't have many slides. I mostly just want to get the group talking. Is that fair? Yep. Okay. So the rest of the agenda for tonight is thinking. We want to give you an overview of what our current thinking is about the forum. Uh, we have a, a loose idea of how we'd like to structure it, and we want to have a discussion tonight. You know, it's like a we want to keep it loose until we also see the data from the RKG. Oh, and we can sit through the presentation in October with you all and hear what your comments are. That meeting in October is, yeah. I want to focus on the time that we have with Eric. I want you to be able to hear as much of the data 
that he's collected and analyzed and for you to be able to ask him any follow up questions. So I don't want to eat up a lot of time talking about the forum. So I'm trying to cover a lot tonight. Um, and Zach and I met with Liz to kind of prep for this today. So does that seem fair? Mm -hmm. So feel free to stop me at any point. Um, and I know also, Peter and Adam, you've been over to the facility and you've met with folks over there and you have all that emotion. So you may have things you want to share at some point too. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll throw that in. Okay. Um, so we're thinking a couple of things for the forum event on the 13th. <clears throat> We don't want it to be boring. So you guys are really consistently showing up and you're participating, which is appreciated. Not everybody does that. And we want them to come back. So what we're talking about doing is, is having a number of things that they can look at when they enter. Um, it may be some of the infographics that Zach showed. It may be some maps so they can see some of the information. But we want to slowly have people start to absorb some of the work that you've been doing as a commission. Um, we also want to collect some information about them. Uh, what we've done in some other communities is had a short um, entry survey, and so some demographic information or, or information. Are you a property owner? Are you a resident? Um, we could do age stuff if we want to get a sense of age or how long people lived in the community or people currently working, are they retired? You know, just to get a sense of like who's in the room. Um, and Zach and Liz started to brainstorm. And we typically do these posters on um, phone core that may have a broad question about, you know, what opportunities or challenges do you see with the housing in New London? And so give people some post-it notes when they're milling around talking to friends and neighbors, and they can write some of these things and stick them up. And I think this came out of a conversation with all of you a while ago. And we even talked about at some point during the meeting, maybe Liz is putting all those into a word cloud that can be shared near the end of the meeting. So we could say, this is a little bit of what we what people were thinking as they came into the room. You know, they're concerned about the availability of water, or they're concerned about the density of development, or they're concerned about community character, or they are worried about people having access to housing they can afford, whatever it may be. Um, so we wanted to have a couple of fun things where we can get some information at the start of the evening. There will be a presentation. We can't get around the presentation part because we're trying to transfer some information. Um, and we're thinking, Peter, as the chair of the commission, if you're willing or if you want to do it with Adam, however you want to do it, but to have somebody from here open the meeting and kind of frame it and say, you know, this is the work that we've done. Uh, the town has successfully given this funding and hired consultants to assist the commission, but the commission's been in existence and give some of the history and kind of frame the evening. And we can work on the details of what that looks like before the 13th. But that would be helpful. And then Liz's recommendation is to try to, once we see Eric's information, to see how we can blend Eric's information and Zach's information. So we can tell the story of our firm specifically worked with Adam and other folks in town hall to look at your data. And this other firm looked at other available data. From the, and he'll explain where it's from, but from the census and from other sources. But we don't want it to just be like one guy talks for 20 minutes and another guy talks for 20 minutes. So we're trying to see where there's overlap or where it makes sense. Uh, so we have to also bring Eric up to speed on Zach's work um, in the process of doing that. So there could be some back and forth. Some of the options that sounded like for that room is that could possibly be done with a couple of people up sitting in comfy chairs with, uh, with really nice slides and kind of talking through. Um, after we've shared the information that we can in the evening, we don't want to just send people home. Because well, now they have this information, so they have questions and they have ideas. And so a couple of the things we played around with are handing out like basically a postcard or a sheet of paper at the beginning when they come in and having one or two broad open-ended questions and providing a few minutes after the presentation for them to collect their own thoughts jot down their own ideas, I'm still concerned about this, or I still don't see an answer to this, or have you considered this, whatever it may be. But they can talk to their neighbor, they can talk to their spouse if they came with a spouse, or they can move around the room, give them 15, 20 minutes, whatever the case may be, and then pause and say, okay, you've had a chance to reflect on what you've heard tonight, you know, what questions come to mind, what concerns do you have? And just have some time where everyone can kind of hear collectively, Wow, is 62% just ringing in everyone's mind and there's a lot of panic and we can explain what that, how that number may come down. Or 
are there just questions about the future phases and we need to explain to people what's next and how they can stay engaged and why they should stay engaged, that they can really shape the direction the London takes. So we're playing around with that. I'm guessing the, the meeting room is kind of auditorium style. Mm -hmm. So we didn't want to try to complicate it or drag the meeting out by having like breakout tables. So we thought, let people stay where they are, give them a moment to think um, and chat and then share. So that's kind of an overview of the framework, but I'm, I'll pause and just see if initial questions or ideas that you have. If you have additional ideas, we're open to them. I just have a comment. Please. I think we all know that it's important to hear from people in the town. And we all know how long a meeting goes yeah. when people are given, even when they're given the hook, they're not moving. Right, they've got the floor, they're good, and and they want to say, and they're entitled to say. We we're very transparent in this town, but then I think that that is problematic mm -hmm. because people may end up saying the same thing in different way, and there's you know there's a, there's as you said there's a sense of well, how are we going to solve it? There's there's like that anxiety of well I'm really worried about X or and, and then there's not enough time maybe to get, so I don't really know what the res resolution is for that, but just concerned about that because we have enough meetings in town where people are allowed to get up and then you're just listening and listening and listening. And I don't I don't feel like the, the aura that you get, the feeling that you want people to get when you leave, you want them to be more upbeat and more questioning and more, Oh, I didn't know that. And well, I'd like to find out more. It, as opposed to, yeah, I don't know. We don't want any grumbling. Is it resonance down low on the grumbling? We've had to deal with this a lot. I'm glad okay. you're voicing it because it's always a concern. And we can do the 30 seconds to share. We can bring it whoever we want. And we will move around with the microphone, you know, either one of us or, or Liz and engage people. We do want to hear from them. The other thing that I should mention is the question or two open ended questions that we provide and just kind of a general place for comment. They can also take that home if they want more time with it. And the, one of the reasons we want to do it is knowing that there may be people doing some watch parties or watching the recording, we want to have it on the website so that sometimes your best ideas are the day after when you digest the information and maybe watch part of the recording. We want to make sure for a couple of weeks we can continue to kind of harvest ideas and do that. So would you just maybe you could uh we could frame this as as an opportunity to ask questions or get clarification okay. rather than advocates. Uh, that's a good idea. Good. No. Very good. But it might just help keep things moving. Another approach might be oh sorry. Um Another concept, uh, by virtue of this being at Colby Sawyer, it seems to me it, it has in the past tended to lift the discussion a little bit. But I, your point's well taken. I don't disagree with you at all on this. That's one of the things that I was hoping for in Colby Sawyer. Uh, but uh, to your point, perhaps if, um, if the cards are collected and somebody sorts through them live at that time, mm -hmm. Uh, you or Zach or somebody, and can put them in categories and pick out the ones that seem to be uh, dwelled on that are that are hit on a number of different ways. And then you can say, well, and then you can paraphrase it. Like you have five postcards that seem to be focused on one question, and it's a constructive question, and it's it's deep and should be great. Answered. That's a great idea. So it's one it takes it away from the sort of emotion or anxiety. And lets you keep leading and moving forward. Yeah. And leading and giving information out. You know, you're doing you're speaking. There's some filtering, but yeah. but yeah. you're not gonna be able to address every question. No, no. So it's a, it's a way of, of combining them. Another thought was to your point about sending the postcards later is we can have a stamped address on the back. Um, they'll have to put a stamp on it. But if if uh, you know that way, if you say take this home and if something occurs to you. Put a stamp on it, send it into us, and we, we want to hear it. We could we drop it someplace also? Could we have could go in the yeah, drop box, box at the town? Uh, yeah. yeah. Drop box and, and we can get a basket box. at the library and other places too for sure. 
Um, it's also anonymous. So, which is right. Yeah. I'm thinking a little bit about your comment, Peter, too, that, and I'm remembering back to the um, forums that we did the set of, I think it's like four years now, um, for the police station and the other sort of general priorities. I don't remember what we called it, but um, I was the one monitoring the Zoom questions. And we very much did that, where instead of asking, you know, um, this person specifically asks this question, we were getting inundated with Zoom questions. We didn't physically have enough time to give everyone. And so we were sitting there saying, okay, three people asked this, they asked it slightly different ways. How do we sort of combine this all to one so that every person got their question asked, so to speak, but it was efficient that, um, you know, people didn't feel like they were just left out because there wasn't time for them. Um, it definitely took some some work and some fluster um, to try and you know put these things together. And I'm sure some people didn't feel like we summarized or paraphrased accurately, but it was an efficient way of getting a lot of um, information out and in one without one person rambling like I'm doing right now at a microphone uh, that takes up everybody's time. Yes. <laughs> Do it again. The people are coming into the building, and what happens? So they come in, and they're not told to sit down right away. They come in, and they we're going to have material. We kind of call it a gallery walk, but they come in, and there'll be some maps and some data. And so you have a chance to look at stuff. And those that have been very engaged can maybe take friends over and explain what they've been seeing or things they're thinking about. Other people it might be the first um, interaction with the information, but just have it out there, have it available, have some of the key findings. That Zach and or Eric are going to share. So people are seeing these things to say, wow, I wonder why that is the case. And kind of hopefully hook them into wanting to listen to the presentation and then hear it maybe a different way or hear the additional backstory. So they get to come in, tell us who they are, give us some initial feedback, look at some of the information. That's what I, I don't yeah. understand that part. I mean, so they come in and there's neat, interesting stuff all around. There's going to be a signing table where they get a name tag where we say, we fill this out. And it's an anonymous, you know, who are you type of thing. It's a little survey. It's demographic information. Who was here for me? So did we get all retirees who lived in town for 30 years? That's an important finding. Mm -hmm. Did we get a bunch of people who work but in they town? they just will take that and go. They'll fill it out and hand it right in. Like in 10 minutes or 15 They'll hand minutes, it out people, three, are, yeah. people are going to be asked to take their seat. Yeah, half hour. A half an hour walking Good. around? Yeah. But by the time people have come in and signed in and looked at stuff, it'll be 20 to 30 minutes. And we're getting snacks. So, right. I mean, that it's should intense. foster a, a sort of what social found, time. When you do this type of a meeting where there's a kind of a soft start and they're having information, the stuff they engage with, they can talk to other people, then there's some content, but it doesn't go for two hours. And then there's a chance to get your question out. People tend to leave feeling like they've had an opportunity to be included in the conversation. It wasn't boring. And they maybe want to share more than they were allowed to, and we make we make a mechanism for that. And, and then, so how do they? How are the questions? I like the idea of gathering the questions and not having people standing and talking on the floor because if you can, so the questions become come at the end. Maybe everybody passes their question to one end or the other of the aisle, and yeah, what somebody we, sorts or it, something. It may be two separate things, and we have to play around with this back at the office, but it may be a short questionnaire where we may have specific questions we want to ask and that we don't address at the end of the meeting. Um, but we want to start to collect what people are thinking about. And we've often just done it with um, note cards. If you have a question, a clarification, you know, the way you framed it, Mike, write it down and pass it, and we'll be out there picking them up. Mm -hmm. And then deputize any number of you that want to help and we can stand up by the front and try to put them in groups and as peter said can't answer them all but we could say wow there are a lot of questions about how it's how here you take that file yeah, and they all relate to the the water quality issue in town or they all relate to types of housing that people are curious about it's also helpful not everybody's comfortable coming to a public meeting and standing up at a microphone to ask a question um so the anonymity in it can be really helpful too yeah that's a good point the, I'll say one other thing about the the gallery walk sort of entrance that that uh, is the soft opening um, for anyone that's coming to just voice a gripe or something. We've seen it a lot of times where we're walking around. The people who want to talk generally find their way to the people <laughs> sort of working the working the room, uh, and that at least gives them a chance to be heard and listened to. And so they're not necessarily standing at the microphone at the end of the meeting saying, hey, by the way, 
my property has such and such. Um, so we see, we've seen it we see it at almost every you know larger public forum. The the people that want to talk find their way so that they're so that they can do that. Right. All right. So you trust us to continue to refine this and make it excellent. Yeah. I'm rolling. Okay. Good. All right. So in order for it to be excellent, and not too long, in order for it to be excellent, we need a lot of people there. We need a lot of people who have lots of questions or curiosity about housing or have never considered housing related stuff, we need a good cross section of folks. So you, with Peter's help today, we started to inundate you with some updates. And what I wanna do is actually just step back and tell you what we've been working on as far as outreach and getting really out about this. And then after tonight, this um, the outreach and engagement plan that you all have seen, I've been <laughs> updating it. I'm gonna send an updated version out, but I'm gonna just tell you what's, happened, what's changed on it. And then we'll send the updated version out in one email, Peter, with, we'll send the flyers to you again. We give you the flyers both as a PDF document and a JPEG. The JPEG is the image file. Some people like to use that for putting in an email or putting in social media blasts or things like that. So we want it to be flexible. Um, so I just want to walk through that. And then I have a couple of questions and wanted to just kind of have a discussion from all of you as commissioners about additional ways that you are willing to help us get the way, get the word out or how we can help you get the word out. So since we last met, um, Adam uh, connected us with Cara at the town office. The project website is up. So that was one of the messages that was sent to you today. Project website is up, uh, Paths Home, the logo's on it. There's a short project description and it's starting to be, you don't like the assumption of justifying. Oh, yeah, he doesn't either. So it's, we're open to Okay. That's a one word, that's a very It's yeah. horrible. So she's willing to take that kind of feedback and to work with us on those changes. But at least we have a landing page and that allowed us to update the flyer and to do the, we did a short article um, that can go into the newsletter and can be used in other print uh, publications, just announcing that this initiative was starting and we want people to know on the 13th of November. Hey, stop for a second, let's we'll catch up with you. Cause I made copies of things so people can, oh, yeah, and, and I've been trying to forward them on uh, just didn't have much time this evening when I received it. So some of this will be getting, but um, that's the that's the blurb that goes. It's available for newsletters or municipal matters or what have you. you sure. say, what did you say? Um, the municipal uh, matters piece that Pete, Peter's handing out is a slightly different version than what's on the website. Okay. And it's open to additional edits of Kim or Adam or Peter, others want to edit it. If there are other publications, other newspapers or newsletters that you want to get it in, feel free to take it and we can adapt it as needed. Um, also, I'm handing out, uh, Karen had, had, uh, from the town staff had sent an email as to where you can find this information on our website. You click on it and the link's there, et cetera. Um, so I just made a copy of that. And it seems like the comment we've heard from a couple of you is that we prefer the text to be left justified. Um, it's now the website text is center justified, so it now it says um, there are a couple of places where it's not like one word in the middle. Oh. Um, and it's for fine, then. yeah. But the text reads nicely, I think, and yeah. it feels oh, so. Yeah. 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 on the website just this afternoon. Kara even helped us get an updated version of the feedback form. So there's a feedback form on the, the Paths Home website that anyone can use and they can use it anonymously if they choose. Um, and the feedback form has the logo, the Paths um, Home logo on the top of it, so it's all been updated. And then there's the flyer. So you should take some of these flyers that Peter nicely printed in color and make sure they get out and other people see them. Um, this flyer is has an updated QR code, the little black squiggly box in the lower right, and has an updated web address to go to Paths Home. So we consistently want to push people to the same location so they're all getting the same information. It's it's clear, it's predictable, um, and they start to kind of know where to go. When should do you think they shouldn't go out? When do you think we should put stuff like this out? As soon as possible. You know, it's this? a save the date. To save the date, we want people to know this is coming. I would say, 
Um, quick clarifying question on the time. Is it that the doors open at six or the program starts at six? I can't remember where we say the doors open at six. Okay. Because I think unless we say another time, we'll have people coming in thinking it's starting at six. Okay. So. Does that mean we're leaving this? Mm -hmm. Maybe that's obvious. Yeah. Okay. Oh, any extra handouts there? No, no. I mean, oh, before he sits down. Oh, no. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm not sitting down. <laughs> Thanks, Mike. Uh, we meet at the 6 p.m. stays in the and we are That's our way of doing the That's when you should be there. That's when we want people. Okay. Yeah. Just double-checking. Yeah, and even if the presentation were to start at 620 or 625 or whatever, but we want them to be there. We want to see how much of the group it is and see, allow them to have time, not rush. Um, but also not still work. Okay. So kind of work that fine line. Just because the owner. Um, a couple other things just so you know are in the works. Uh, Renee, who couldn't be here tonight, the housing navigator, she has got a quote. Um, we do have a company out of Hanover that she's identified, um, and they can do the mailer to all postal addresses for the new London. Um, they're going to pay for this as well. So they're going to pay for the printing, which is about $1,500. And they're going to pay for the postage, which is on top of that. We'll are paying for it too? Um, the housing navigator. So through Upper Valley, oh. of New York and see yeah. Renee, who comes to the meetings. Oh, yeah. Uh, Peter has the navigator the grant member combined with other towns. Yeah. yeah. yeah there was some money that they work with on there. So that's a huge win. Peter connected with Renee on because that means it's not using your funds for the printing. We can use your funds for posters and other kinds of handouts and stuff um, as we go. So that's in the works. We had talked last meeting about getting that mail around at the end of October so that people would get that like the beginning of November and it wouldn't be so far out and it wouldn't be as maybe it wouldn't be as I don't know. Maybe there could be as many political mailings probably that flip it with. And I'm curious. I I wonder how much control you have over the date of it. I think a lot. You mean when it, you mean right. when it goes out? So maybe like the sixth, um, because I think that last week before the election, people's mailboxes are probably going to be full of stuff that looks just like this that they're just throwing in the recycling. We can ask for we have that specific. I mean, that's fine. I mean, it'd just be a week prior to people then. But the problem is. If you say we're going to get it out, then when does it actually get out? The mail, I mean, mail is, as we know, crazy these days. So we want it to arrive in their boxes on the 6th. I would say either the 6th or at least a week before the election. But that sort of last week, I'm guessing we'll all be inundated with all sorts of stuff. Um, that avoiding that. Halloween to the fifth time period. Okay. Halloween. So either prior to Halloween or the sixth. I think so. Okay. And throw it in with candy. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and that's actually Halloween is a big undertaking in New London. There are a lot of people on Main Street. Um, Peter and I will be away the night that we said because Halloween celebrated is the Sunday night before actual Halloween. Actually, we will all, four of us will likely be at kneecap, but yeah. I assume you guys are going. Uh, but maybe some volunteers stand on corners in New London and have some advertising. I mean, I think last year there was something like 6,000 people um, or some outrageous number that might be really over the top, but it was a lot. <laughs> that would be a creative way to get the word out, if possible. Yep. Um, I know it's hard to get people's attention when they're with kids and it's yeah. dark and it's, um, but even if one, one of the, it, maybe it's the town office, someone giving out candy to kids on Halloween gives out a little card that has it. I mean, if we, if we're truly trying to reach that younger demographic, that may be the, the way we hit it. Their parents should be with them. But I do want to stress, uh, getting us save the date out now. And uh, you will see when you get home tonight on your email, uh, this was sent to you in PDF form, also JPEG. So I would encourage to, you to send it out to friends and people you know who uh, might want to attend to save the date. And uh, I can think of more people I want to send it to, <clears throat> groups of people that would be interested. And, uh, 
and to to make sure they get some calendar. I mean, that was the last thing I was gonna. You stole my thunder. As far, no, no, it's good. Um, it's a good segue because really, with these two things that Peter provided to you, there's a script that you could use for an email if you want to send an email out to other boards or committees, your other organizations, anyone you're affiliated with, your neighbors. Um, the personal invite from each of you as people who volunteer and put a lot of time into understanding this issue and fostering a conversation around this issue, it's going to be big. And if you reach out to 10 or 20 people, it's likely that you'll get a high percentage of those folks to attend or at least to watch it online and answer questions later. Um, so I was going to say the same. If we can get this out to all the land use boards, but if there's a personal appeal, a personal appeal from folks that have been attending and been participating and informing this, it goes a long way. So, and deputize people, make them ambassadors of the housing discussion. I mean, we don't know what's going to come out of this, but we can't decide that or have anything that's going to be workable without people participating and saying, asking questions, seeing what they like, what they don't like. So that was that was it for what I had as far as outreach engagement. It's really just we need to kind of beat the drum and maybe Peter will work with you and Adam to periodically get some updates out to the commission so that you're all reminded that we need to get people in on the 13th. And then we'll get the mail around. We'll do the other things we can do. But if, if there are additional ideas or requests of us, we're all ears. Um, I have, uh, in the past with this commission, tried to bundle uh, pieces, documents, and information that goes out to you from me by email so you're not inundated. But I think we're seeing a lot more uh, stream of information that's coming from our P&D. So you're going to see a few more of, hey, I'm bouncing this to you. This just came in. I want you to see it as opposed to waiting to collect it. Um, so just be patient with me, you'll see a few more. And I'm not always gonna take the time to put a wrapper around it because you know what's going on, but I'll I'll send it on to you saying this just in from Steve or Zach or, or whatever. Um, my creative wheels are kind of spinning. Is All right. Anybody yeah. creative and wants to work on a pumpkin person competition on the front lawn of the town office? I mean, it's the two weeks prior that we could have some sort of housing themed um, pumpkin person display that advertises when it is, um, it may be. Who usually, who usually does your pumpkin person? We don't participate because we're not the craftiest group, um, but, <laughs> <laughs> um, but if there are volunteers here that uh, are crafty, and, you know, we can certainly help, help with that. <laughs> or know somebody who's artistic and would do it. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting idea. I think it's a great idea. Yeah. yeah. So this would be something that would be out on the front lawn of the town office. Right. So many of the attention. businesses on Main Street participate. Um, some who are not located on Main Street use the green or the town office front lawn. Um, I'd say there's usually a dozen or so. Um, and they go up the third week of October through it's Halloween. Mountains. I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, I think the I think it starts at the beginning of October. You can put them out anytime you have to do the registration. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen that yet. Yeah. Is it the type of thing that if there were a pumpkin person or pumpkin people, like a banner or something could be with them? Yes. We could always print up a banner for you with Pass Home and like the date of the event. They're relatively inexpensive to get into a weatherproof banner. So if you can get the you just need the, you you need the pumpkin young people. pumpkin family with a little pumpkin and a stroller <laughs> up into a house. Or... <laughs> That's a clever idea. That's a clever idea. Let's bake that some more. Amy, you stimulated by that idea? No. You look interested. I'm just. Well, I am interested. Um, okay. I had a question though. Yes. The um, the flyers, postcards, announcement, that line, the direct communications, the advertisement, articles, direct mailing. Yes. Is that all being handled by you? Yeah. So us with help from staff. Okay. So like social media communications, we can't. And I know that's a limitation here as far as Facebook pages, but if there are Facebook pages, especially where people are acting them down, that some of you can post the JPEG of the save the date and the little description about what it is, that's helpful. Adam can help us get word out to the land use boards and other boards and committees. Yep. Okay. okay. Um, I'll just quickly report back to you, Adam and I. Adam, you wanna report on the meeting we had to Colby Sawyer? Sure. Um, so yesterday, Peter and I met with Willa at Colby Sawyer, um, discussed the layout of the room, um, about 150 people theater style um, is the way that we had discussed setting it up. 
Um, they do have the capacity for more than that if the, the side wings um, had the curtains open. We discussed with them keeping the curtains closed, but I guess that's something that maybe if we're really advertising, I guess maybe we should prepare for like a, a plan B if all of a sudden the room is filling up and we need you know additional seating, which I hadn't really thought about. Um, do you remember, I'm sorry to interrupt, but do you remember how many we had last time? When it was here no, or the last one at Cold Story? Yeah, when we had people who had businesses in town up on mm -hmm. the... I think all the seating was filled, generally maybe a few seats here and there, which is about 100. And we had a few standing in the back. Some people don't like to sit that long. Right. Um, so I would say it wasn't standing room only per se. So maybe around 100 plus maybe... 110 or so. Okay. And I think we used some of the couch furniture that time, which is obviously yes. isn't as efficient yes. as the, the theater style. So I think they do have more capacity with the, the chairs. Great. Right. Um, and then anything else? No, I think that's it. Um, I, I would add that we are uh, planning on having some food and refreshments. Um, we have a budget for that. And so it's part of the hospitality and uh, engaging with the public and breaking down barriers and make people comfortable so they'll participate and, and be excited to be there. Um, so that, that is going to be part of the program and it's built into our expense base for the grant, which is up to a certain amount and I have to keep an eye on that. Um, so I'm going to work with, uh, we'll work with Steve and Zach and his team on the configuration of the room because now we're hearing you want some tables and some gallery space and so at some point we'll want to work that out. They did give us a blank form uh, to work with to sketch out what we think we may want. Um, People arrive here. Yes. So I wonder if those those areas to the side, those kind of wing areas, might be where we have some yeah. of the material set up so we can get people in. Let them yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Great. We were thinking have a have curtains to keep people focused, but that's a great suggestion. Maybe they're half open. No, 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 no. Don't keep no. it open at all. Whatever you want. Open them and. Then... Okay. Because then you're having people go this way, you're getting a floor to go this way, and then they have to come back to sit down. Okay. Yeah. You got to think about flow also. To the left and right, if you're facing the stage, there's to the left and the right, there seems to be big areas. Oh, yeah. That's yeah. Right. Yeah. 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 We've got Zach and I, I mean, Adam and I were just shooting from the hip, so please. Steve Adams got a copy of that so he can send it along to us. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then we know what yesterday, right? Yes. And yep. you can have your copy back. Okay. I won't see. Yeah. <laughs> Um, the remote component will be handled through the community access television, um, assuming that they're available tonight now that we have everything signed off, I'll get um, in touch with him, but he will videotape it and then it will be available. He'll give us the download of it, but on their website as well. And it'll be on the town website. Correct. Yep. Just awesome. similarly to, um, how the last three selectmen forms went. Yeah. So it's slightly different than how our typical meetings are posted, but much the same too. So we're progressing on that. We will, uh, and we, by the way, we get a discount from Colby Sawyer. They've been very helpful. And there are a lot of things they're doing for us as part of a price, the staff to lay it out and organize it, move chairs, and they're being very accommodating and we appreciate it immensely. Um, do you have a feeling for how many microphones we'll need? I think we need to give Lindsay that detail. I would only think a couple. I mean, I can't imagine. I think just so you're not having to like bring them one back and forth to each other, but I can't imagine if you and you and Peter were to be up there with us and we're answering and Zach and Eric are answering questions. And we had three, maybe. Yeah. Three um, movable or lapel or Maybe movable. Okay. Yeah. Maybe there's two lapel for the two primary presenters, but um, some flexibility so that if we are sifting through people's questions and we see there's a theme and we want to hand Peter a bunch of questions, he can pick a microphone and say, okay, there are a couple of questions, man, I can address this. Or I want to hand it off to Steve. Okay. Also, uh, this, these are some of the details we'll need to resolve, but just so you know, if you the, the uh, platform will be raised a little bit right. and they can have seats that are comfortable or or more rigid chairs, whatever you want, but there's a big screen uh, behind it. And if, the, if the, the visual is so important, we may not want to have people sitting in front of it necessarily. Right. So maybe move to the side, but those are the details we've got to work out. And, uh, I was going to ask on, on the stage area, how far, <clears throat> excuse me, how far from the front of the stage is the uh, screen? I'm thinking of Whipple Hall where it's 
a good distance back. Is the screen no. pretty close to no. the front? No, maybe it's 10, not that. 10, 12 feet, maybe. Yeah, I was going to say something like 12 or 15, okay. but yeah, it's uh, it's close enough. Comfortable that enough. If you're sitting there as a presenter and you, it's it's really right behind okay. them. Great. Yeah. So we need to figure out a way to get those details resolved with you because um, you need to see it. Maybe you could do it on a FaceTime call or something. Or could we arrange when we come to see it? When Eric comes to present in October, could we go before mm. the meeting? Most likely. I'll I mean, it depends somewhat if it's just for 10 minutes. Um, you know, oh, yeah, they're sure. using it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe just I'll reach out. In the door. We'll do that. Yep. That would be maybe good. Maybe and then maybe that's on the 23rd, correct? Yeah. Correct. Okay. Okay. Um, so next steps. We pretty much hit on them. I think it's we need to now take the flyer and make a postcard version um, and work with Renee to get that ready and to answer the question about when it will hit mailboxes um, around Halloween or after the election. Um, and we need to continue to refine the materials and the format for the for the actual uh, forum. And part of the reason, Peter asked me a good question the other day, but part of the reason this ended, this meeting ended up being a little earlier in the month, I think, than some of our others, and the next one's a little later in the month. So we have a little bit of a gap between this meeting and our next meeting. Part of that is that's when we could get RKG associates to do the analysis. And so we want to make sure that they have both the chance to finish their analysis, but that we also have a chance to run it through um, some reviewers that have local knowledge, so Adam, Peter, and anyone else that you want to share with before they come and present to you. Because if there's something that's just incorrect, we don't want to waste time at that meeting, um, or if there's something that just seems like it's not the focus for this first phase. Because um, they often they will bring a lot more information. It'll end up in a draft report. The draft report will end up being available um, hopefully to you before he comes to present. So if you have a chance to review it, we can put it up on the website so people can see it. We might get some people that actually come to the meeting and want to hear a rate from Eric. Um, it'll likely be a little bit more involved presentation than what we'll be able to do on the 13th because it's, it's a deeper dive. It's like, kind of like what Zach has been doing to you the last couple of meetings. You know, you, it's more the inner workings and a lot of data. Um, he does a good job. It won't be painful. It'll be really entertaining. Okay. So that's uh, and get the word out, get the word out, get the word out. Yeah, yeah. Reach out, distribute it. So I think that's it. And uh, so housing updates. Don't have anything this week. Um, nothing has no changed news. from the status that I'm aware of. So water is the other than the forest. Right the 406 Main Street development is uh, very close. Uh, talked to the property owner the other day, so. Those will be online hopefully in the next four to six weeks. Um, I, I would just go back quickly uh, to Steve's comment about the, the gap in time between uh, this meeting and the October 23rd meeting. That's 42 days. Believe it or not, I track that kind of stuff. <laughs> and uh, there may be a time when, when we want to meet in between if we're thinking that we're not getting a word out or whatever. So uh, I'll be getting back to you, but we may want to have another meeting just to say, hey, we're people are confused or we need more information. You want to say something, Amy? No. Okay. Uh, so I'll get back to you on that. If you have that meeting, maybe get a pumpkin beforehand and you can carve it up. <laughs> there you go. That's <laughs> What's that? Oh, yes. Okay. Future meetings. Um, October 23rd, that's the one uh, that Steve just referenced where RKG will be there. Uh, we'll use some time with them at Colby Sawyer before or after to go through the layout to make sure it flows. Um, I have on this list of future meetings 5.30 at Colby Sawyer. That's not correct. It will be 6 o'clock. Um, and I have also thrown in, this is new, November 20th meeting, which is uh, just a week after the Colby Sawyer event, because I found that our commission uh, generates some really good ideas if it's right after an event, and we all sit around and say, what do you think? How'd it go? What could we do better? What's What did we learn? What are the takeaways? Um, 
So uh, I've asked to I've asked you if you would please consider to put that on your calendar. November twentieth is a week after it's a Wednesday, um, and we may be in we probably will be in Whipple Hall, but we have to see if budget committee might preempt us. And, uh, so it might not be Whipple Hall, but I'd like to, to put that on the calendar um, as a as a time to brainstorm. Any other thoughts? I I just had a question going back to the Colby Sawyer, <clears throat> knowing that the program starts. Doors open at six o'clock. What time can we get in there? Uh, eight o'clock that morning. Sure. Okay, so it's open all day. Great. Yep. Uh, Peter, for the November twentieth meeting, I just checked, and I think we're both available, depending on who from our team needs to be here. But um, we should have any of the. If we have open-ended questions, like a short exit survey, and we'll have the demographic information. So there should be some stuff that we didn't get a chance to look at with you at the forum. That we'll be able to report back on um, that we learn have learned from who was there, what they've asked, and the people that have participated virtually. So there'll be some additional information. Great, great. And and I didn't run that by you because I was thinking that's so soon, right over the thirteenth. If we could participate by Zoom, we have to. That would work too. Or we can provide a memo and provide the data and get it out. So yeah, you can yep. talk about it. Either way. We we do have Zoom capacity. In fact, this room is good for it. Uh, so uh, thank you. That's helpful. Uh, why don't we stop for a moment and see if uh, if our guests have any thoughts or comments? This is a lot of logistical stuff, uh, but your input's always uh, important. So please, yes, Rich, uh, that microphone I hope works. If you turn it on, sure. Identify yourself so yep. you're being recorded. Just slide it, Rich. Uh, yep. There you go. Rich, that's me. So in that 62% just jumps out and we, we see my mind, mind a lot of questions come up. Um, so I guess one observation, and then I'm not sure what you kind of after, but it would make me think, oh, without any zoning changes, 62% is developable, no zoning changes. In it. It's what comes to my mind. I'm not sure how other people will see it. Um, they may be contradicting myself. But a number outside of Comparison and context sometimes has little meaning. So I, don't, I mean, if I understand right, like, we don't have comparable information from like Springfield and Wilmot, but people went, okay, so 62%. I'm not sure it will have that much meaning without any context. I'm not sure if there's other communities in New Hampshire that you've done work, you can, they might may be somewhat comparable, but. If that's at all possible, it would be great. I mean, I would, right. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think um, just to reiterate, the 62, we know that's high right now, and that is going to drop significantly. So I don't I, I don't want us to get, I don't want us to leave this meeting and think 62% period, it's done deal. Um, so that number is going to drop, no question. Uh, you might have more to say about surrounding communities. Yeah, I want to finish with what Zach said too. I think you're asking an important question. I appreciate that. <laughs> Part of that is well, how much do we want to, how much do we want to refine that in phase two and into phase three even of this project, and we can refine it further, as Zach said. And yet we know there will be opportunities, and then part of that will be if there are opportunities for housing, can we identify what's most appropriate? So back to the blurring and non-blurring of property lines, um, and then can we understand within those areas what type of housing? The community would support if we could pass a town meeting. And so all of that is that reduction and kind of focusing in a way that like a master plan often doesn't get into that level of detail that you're getting into in this exercise. Um, so I think if you're patient with us, we'll see that it's less than 50%. I don't know what the number will be. And really it's the areas in a lot of ways that are more important and the type of housing that is either already allowed or could be allowed, whatever the town decides. Comparing it to another community is almost apples and oranges because we're, we're working in a community in Massachusetts that's, you know, more than 30% of the town is conserved. And then it has other factors. Um, looking, knowing some of your surrounding communities and having lived in this area, there are some things that just are different. But you are also at a, one end of the spectrum, whereas places like Bedford, where we just finished doing a project, has very little of, of percentage that is available for development. Like they're almost filled out. Um, and so it's telling us there's opportunity, but to what degree and to where would the lender like to see additional units go? 
if you were to ignore it and not be doing this process, I think your point is right that under existing zoning, kind of any of the developable lots can become housing, right? And so if the market were to support it, any buildable lot can become a house. And if that were to play out the way it would, like you would see in a build out, it would probably be kind of a scary thing. It may not inform us as much, it might just terrify us. Um, so that's why I think you took a, a more holistic approach. So the 60, just a little addition to that, the 62% is a land area. So that land area is made up of a number of different size parcels, some two acres, some one acre, some four acre. So it's not, doesn't really tell you the number of lots that could be built on potentially uh, that we haven't studied to be further constrained. It's a very difficult number. And I guess what you're hearing is as a commission, we're uncomfortable with it out there because it's, it's too vague. Uh, and, and that's why you've heard the commission, I think, say, um, you know, we've got to work on that number so we so it's more representative of something people can digest, including me and my pea brain. Uh, so you're seeing sausage being made here, but it's it's based on facts that are real. It's the tax assessor's data, it's grinding it out and doing the analysis. It's a question of how it's presented. But I guess I don't know if like I'm not sure if of that 62, like is it 95 percent of it is because they could put the use on? I mean, I'm not sure what's up this mix is up. This is getting to exactly what I said. <laughs> But I think a lot I of think, it. I think one thing we might, one thing we might do to address um, Rich's concern is to is to put the other end of the barbell on and say, all right, well there there are how many lots are there that are developable that don't already have a building on them, uh, and so because those are you know that's that's your raw inventory. Everything else requires something to happen. Somebody who lives on a house wants to build it, or lives on a lot wants to build an ADU. Somebody has to sell and so forth and so on. But there, there is a number somewhere of those lots, those, those that acreage in the town of New London that, that is developable that doesn't have building on it, a house or part of it. So, and I think you'll find that that number is significantly smaller. We know it is, right? Yeah, yeah so I, I can tell you, yeah, it, it, it's, it's like, definitely smaller. Of, of all single family lots, the number was in the one of the slides, of all single family lots, 15% of them are vacant and have no structure. But I can, 15% of those. But I think there's a missing link there between some lots that will be classified as developed maybe one house on 100 acres or one house on yep. 50 acres or 15 or whatever right. it may be. But I but what I'm, what I'm, guess what I'm saying is that if, if I have a house on 100 acres, um, you'll someone will have to decide, me or someone will have to make me decide to build something on it. And which is different from having uh, a lot of five acres with nothing on it or even in two acres with nothing on it. That is a, that's enough. That's a real opportunity that doesn't require me to take an action on my property and say, oh, she was, I think I can build, X, I can subdivide this into X number of units on it. Because, hey, I might not want to. I might like my 100 acres and I want to keep it that way for the next 50 years. So it's I think the unconstrained, huh? Even half an acre. Even half an acre. So, um, so. And then, and then one, and then parcel, or then shave that down to those parcels of land that don't have significant other impediments to being developed, i.e., no water. Um, and, and I think if you go from, I think you'll find something less than fifteen percent as an available number. I think what we're and hearing that would put it the that would put the other end of the conversation rich, and then totally. you've got the spectrum of. Capacity. I think what we're hearing from Rich and from you and from others tonight is the 62% is a scary number. It's a misleading number. I think we can repackage the information. And when we get to that map that Zach showed to say, we know that there are areas of town that can support development. And we can spell out how we need in the next phase to get into the details to understand some that are easily developable, some that have constraints on them, some that are because of the existing zoning would not be. Um, be drones. Um, but we can play around with the message and not necessarily show the percent. 
and get the point across that there are opportunities here, but there are also other details that have to be sorted out. And then the community has to continue to inform us about what's left, whatever it may be, um, whether it requires you know the homeowner or property owners to be engaged or just to put it up for sale. We can start to split those hairs a little bit. Does that make sense? And I think a lot of it sort of focuses on setting the the stage of why that number is in here because I think you know Rich's natural um, instinct that we've all had too is to jump to that you know well the, what conclusion are we going to draw from that and what solution are we going to draw from that and I think those are great questions but that's not the point of why it's in here yet those are stages two and three and so I think in a lot of ways all of our minds are sort of racing along to a point that we shouldn't be at yet and <laughs> so I mean I think maybe just putting the guardrails on the number before we're opening that slide so that people aren't immediately well what about what does that mean this we don't know those yet. That that those are good questions, and they will get answered at some point. It's not the point of that slide being aware at that time. And, and does that make sense? Right? Yes, yes, okay. Sure, sure. I don't want you to walk away thinking sixty-two percent. Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> I have a quick, real quick opinion on what you were on different topic that you discussed. My personal opinion would be good to have the property name boundaries in those propositions. I think more information is good, and can frustrate people saying where. Right. We're in the yeah. Okay. We're getting here. Thank you. Anybody else? No. Thanks. Thanks for joining us. Any other comments? I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. We're ten minutes late. I'm sorry. So moved. So moved. Second. 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 All in favor? Aye. Aye.